Bring it off. Oh, my wife's going to preach at him. Okay, uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6 and in 1 Corinthians 3. Matthew 6 and then 1 Corinthians 3. This is part 2 of uh, being rich toward God. On a Sunday night, Brother Tremaine Ware talked about uh, having riches toward God. He didn't have time to say how to get riches toward God, so I told him I'm going to complete that for him. Matthew 6 is a doctrine prior to Calvary. Technically, it's doctrine that's aimed more at the millennium, but still, the general idea here is, is here. Uh, Paul's, um, Paul's doctrinal statement on this same idea is in 1 Corinthians 3, so we'll go with that one. Matthew 6, verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. But notice your responsibility, verse 20, is lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Okay, Paul's uh, take on that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is doctrine for a New Testament born-again believer. Okay, and he mentions uh, here in this context about three precious metals, if you call the third one a metal, but a precious stone. But you know, two precious metals and precious stone. Okay, this is the doctrinal footing for a born-again believer, verse 10. And it says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, <clears throat> I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. That's the responsibility of every born again believer. Jesus said in Matthew 6, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Paul said, take heed how he buildeth thereupon. And the, he's implying some type of building, obviously, or work. Verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. And you would tend to think, who'd want to put that in your house? But there is a, there is a, a design to build a house with a bales of straw. Has anybody ever seen those designs? Few, okay. Pretty good insulation, probably. But uh, you have wood, hay, stubble, and then verse 13, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Notice he keeps accenting on the word work. This is the efforts uh, and the work of a born-again believer after salvation being tried at the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 14, If any man's work abide which is built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. The man who portrays that is Mr. Lot. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do pray to help us to understand this truth, understand this doctrine for a New Testament believer, and I pray that you'd help us to uh, not try to uh, serve Thee because it pays, because then it will not pay to serve Thee, but to serve Thee because we love Thee. And I just pray that you'd help each and every one of us uh, born-again people that uh, you might demonstrate our love for You by uh, trying to be a blessing to You. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, last week I went through uh, a little bit of this gold idea of laying up treasures in heaven. And the idea here is there's a saying that it pays to serve the Lord. But don't serve the Lord because it pays, because then it will not pay to serve the Lord. And the idea is there's a motive there. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says our motive is because we love Jesus Christ first and foremost. Okay, if we have not charity, then we are as nothing. And that charity is love towards Jesus Christ 
What we do, we do for Jesus Christ. Yes, it is performed often for other men, but our love is because of Jesus Christ himself. Last week I gave a couple thoughts on this. and The oxymoron about God's program of riches in heaven, riches toward heaven, is the oxymoron, it is done through poverty. Uh, the world thinks poverty to a point where it's actually giving out to others, giving out to the Lord. Where the world says, man, you're going to get poor going that way. But way and, and that may be true on earth. But the idea is building riches toward heaven. It's kind of funny. Uh, I taught a little bit of this up at Camp Summit on uh, Friday night. You know, you got 12, I had 12 uh, young men in there. And we were talking ages anywhere from 14 to 17 and I was going through this, and one kid asked a question at the end. Does that mean I can't buy a truck? <laughs> Can I have a truck, you know, and still be rich toward God? And I just kind of chuckled. I'm thinking, you want to have a shotgun in the back window, too? You know, a Confederate flag in the plates. And, and I said, yes, sir. First Timothy chapter 6 also reveals that one can have wealth on earth and wealth in heaven. But I said, man, that is few and far between. Very few and far between, because often what the number one killer of Myers and Christianity is the idea of merchandise, getting things. That's what's ruining the church more than anything. Okay, but still he was concerned about that. I showed him First Timothy chapter 6. Okay, another thought I mentioned last week is there obviously is a danger of focusing on earthly riches. It's deceptively powerful. It is the greatest tool that Satan's used in to deceive the church today. And obviously, it's doing a wonderful job uh, from the devil's perspective. And last week, I mentioned also that creating riches in heaven is a personal responsibility. It's not uh, what your parents do for you. It's not what your siblings do for you. It's what you do for you. It's what you do for Jesus Christ in particular. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, or th- chapter 3, notice the foundation is the same. The foundation is Jesus Christ. He is the rock. The question is, is He your foundation? Is He your Savior? Uh, The matter of faith in Jesus Christ is like the difference between watching a baseball game and playing the baseball game. Watching it, you may know the game and you uh, enjoy the game and you believe in the game, but playing it is realizing that the game is meant for you to play. Knowing a lot of people, not a lot of people in churches, they know about Jesus Christ, they know about Him in their head, and they're going to miss heaven by 18 inches because they don't have the belief in their heart. And that's a tough thing because it says in 2 Timothy, the Lord knoweth whose are His. You and I don't know. And we'll get to 2 Timothy here in a short bit, but still... The foundation, verse 11, is Jesus Christ. Not baptism, not good works. Nothing to do with sacraments. The foundation of Jesus Christ, that is the one and the same. Jesus Christ, the same for all. Now, what kind of a spiritual, quote, house or work is one creating in heaven? Verse 10 says at the end of the verse, Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. What is a shack, an outhouse, nothing? be like a tornado comes into a trailer park and you've got everything just scattered everywhere and there's a foundation. Hey, it's better than nothing. Better than nothing. Okay, but the idea. Now, here's God's promises. First, I want to give you is God's promises is that He promises to continually work in the life of the believer until that believer sees Jesus Christ. That is a promise of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, the promise. Now, the Bible is such a technical book, meaning the King James Bible. It is a very precise book. It is a legal document that God has laid out to man. And when you get reading legal documents, you're going to discover how precise you have to be in legal terms. And the Bible is written in a fashion that if a man wants to deceive himself, he can use the Bible to deceive himself with it. The Bible reads that heart. So the Bible is very technical, and, it, and there's no loopholes, but you've got to make sure you see exactly what is said to whom it's spoken. Now, Jesus Christ said, when a man is born again, John chapter 3, he said, except you be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. He repeated that verse 5 
in a different fashion, except you be born of the water and of the Spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, I may have switched the word enter or see in that matter, but still the process, the promise is that as a result of the new birth, the born again believer is promised to see and enter the kingdom of God. In that context, the kingdom of God is referring to the millennial kingdom. The kingdom of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God generally in the Bible is referring to the spiritual kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. But a lot of times, it becomes the physical kingdom of the millennium because they're one and the same during the millennial time period. So the promise to the born-again believer is that you will see and enter the kingdom of God. John chapter 3, Jesus Christ said, Why? Because you're born of God. John chapter 1, verse 12. You're born of God, therefore you have His DNA in you. <clears throat> Okay, that's because of the new birth. Not, I'm not talking Old Testament doctrine. I'm talking New Testament doctrine. Old Testament is a different ballgame. Tribulation is a different ballgame. Millennial is a different ballgame. Okay, and so the promise is a new birth, is entrance into the millennial kingdom because the believer is a child of God. Romans 8, verse 16 says that the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we're a child of God. Now, that child... Okay, as a child of a parent, a parent may have some estate or wealth or somewhat. There's an inheritance that can be given out. And Second John verse 8 says that you ought to take heed to yourselves. Take heed to yourselves. And then he says that you receive a full reward. Second John verse 8. There's no chapters in Second John. He says, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we have received a full reward. There's a young man who asked a question to me Friday afterwards, black kid, and he said, uh, he said if, he's, I, you know, if, if a person wins someone to Christ, and that person messes up, that's how he says that, messes up, and then that person messes up, he says, uh, do they lose that reward? I said, uh-huh. Reward's gone. Why? Second John verse 8 implies that. It's like a child's been disinherited. Now, a child that's disinherited, do they forfeit the DNA? No, they've been disinherited. Okay, and that's what he's referring to here. Okay, and so you build an inheritance or a reward for heaven, but you remain faithful unto death, and that reward will be waiting. When one does not remain faithful, the inheritance is forfeited. Now, the quality of that inheritance, in, in 1 Corinthians it talks about what sort it is. What sort? That's quality. The quality of the inheritance determines the place or role that you will play in the Millennial Kingdom because Jesus Christ is looking for priests and kings in the Millennial Kingdom. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, the Millennial Kingdom he will have kings and priests. Jesus Christ is the King of kings. And the kings and priests will be faithful prophets of Jesus Christ during their life. The three titles always given to Jesus Christ. Prophet, priest, king. Always given that order like Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Prophet, priest, king. Jesus Christ on earth three and a half years was a prophet. Now he is a priest interceding for the believer. Looking forward to him being a king. You and I's main role as a born-again believer is a prophet of God. We also can be a priest to intercede for others. He tells us to do that. We ain't kings yet, my friend. We ain't kings. You got no cross, you get no crown. In sports, they say no pain, no gain. Okay, and so that's the idea as far as this quality. The quality of one's in service or inheritance determines the place in the millennial kingdom and service for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the promise to the born-again believer, if you would look in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 is doctrine for a born-again believer. Romans 8 verse 1, when you're in Christ, there's no condemnation. That's dealing with eternal condemnation or damnation. There's no condemnation to them who walk, in, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, here's the promise. Romans 8, verse 29. It says, For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be saved. Is that what it says? 
No, you get that reading when you go down to DeMott in the duchy area. They'll take predestination and apply that to salvation. It don't apply to salvation as election doesn't apply to salvation. Both of those terms apply to service or the life of a born-again believer after salvation. It's like when you <clears throat> get on uh, the internet, buy an airplane ticket, you bought the ticket to fly somewhere. You are predestinated to that location. You are not predestinated to buy the ticket. Your free will exercise was exercised to purchase the ticket. Once you purchase the ticket, you are predestinated to, well, let's say, Los Angeles. You are not, your destination is Los Angeles. You're not there, so it's a predestination to get to Los Angeles. You got that predestination by buying the ticket. In Romans 8, it is not salvation. You're predestinated to be conformed to the image of His Son that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. The promise is that when you're born again, you are predestinated. Your destination someday will be like Jesus Christ. You are not like Him, 1 John 3 says. You're not like Him. Okay, but you will be like him someday. That's the destination. The promise is in Romans 8.30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now notice those terms. Justification. Glorification. Words like that are doctrinal words. They are salvation, often with salvation. Those are King James Bible words. You don't hear Christians mention those words anymore. They're too busy being dumbed down by the new Bibles. Now, when you know Bible doctrine on salvation is justification, glorification, there's a word that's in the middle that's missing in, this, in these two. And the one that's missing in the middle is sanctification. Justification is one-time act. Romans 5, verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and that's like your birth. The first time you were born, you were born in, born in a moment of time. 2.30 in the morning. That's normal, babies. Okay? Got to keep you all up. Okay, so you're born at a specific moment of time, one-time act, justified. That's a legal act. That's a legal determination. God who declared His Son unrighteous, unholy on Calvary, who was righteous and holy, He will declare a believer in Jesus Christ righteous and holy when He's not righteous and holy. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. That's justification. Now, when a man is justified, he is promised, verse 30, to be glorified. The glorification is a one-time act. When you see Jesus Christ, you will be like Him. What about the in-between there? That's sanctification. Sanctification is by faith. But it's a process of growth also. Where I was born at one moment in time, but I grew as a child. My DNA did not change as far as it was always from my parents. And so that's sanctification. Now, when a person is justified, you will be glorified like Jesus Christ someday. What about that sanctified? Does that mean that when I'm glorified, I get an inheritance? Uh-uh. That is determined upon your behavior from justification to glorification. Proof of that, if you would look in uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 32. The Bible is very precise on these things. Very precise. And when a man does not weigh every word in the Bible, like Jesus Christ said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God, then they come up with a bunch of goofy little ideas. And these ideas will contradict Scripture here and there. You try to apply it right. Acts 20, verse 32. Notice the wording. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up. <clears throat> build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are justified. No. It's sanctified. The inheritance is to the sanctified. Another witness, Acts 26, verse 18. 
Acts 26, verse 18, Paul repeated this. Fivefold ministry of Paul, fivefold aspects of his ministry. <clears throat> Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that ye may receive forgiveness of sins. Receiving forgiveness of sins, that's justification. And uh, inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. See, by faith that is in me. That's what I'm aiming at. The promise of the born-again believer, the final outcome is Christ-likeness. Okay, glorification. You see, God's working in the life of the believer's promise. Philippians 1, six. being confident of this very thing, that He which hath begun a good work in you will, not might, will perform it in the day of Jesus Christ. The day of Jesus Christ is the judgment seat of Christ. <clears throat> How does He do this? It's like you're playing chess. You're playing chess with God. He's on one side, you're on the other side. He makes a move. You make a move. He makes a move. You make a move. He makes a move. You make a move. Your sovereignty versus His sovereignty. You see? Make a move. Now, you're going to get in checkmate. Hey, man, you're not, you're not going to win the game. How long He plays the game, that's up to God. Checkmate is when you are in complete submission to the other party. Your king is lost. You are not the king anymore. He's the king. That's checkmate. Now, he's going to win the game no matter what. You see? And that's what happens. Now, what if I make a fleshly move? He's going to make a move to counter your move. Why? Because he's promised to perform a good work in you. And his move may box you in a corner to get you where you want. But he's not going to go against you. He's not going to force his will upon you. God wants voluntary friendship. Just like you and I want. Okay, so that's, that's how the thing's working. Now, everyone will reap what they sow, saved or lost. That is a universal law of life. Saved man, lost man. Each are responsible for their actions and how they affect others. No man is an island to himself. Romans 14.7 says, No man liveth to himself, no man dieth to himself. But what kind of DNA is in that individual? When a man is born again, he has spiritual DNA from God. And ultimately, he will be like Jesus Christ. Okay, a parallel passage with this idea. Look in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Now remember, 1 Corinthians mentions the foundation. The foundation is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 2.19 says the same idea. Verse 19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. That's Jesus Christ. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. Now you and I don't know. There's only three people, if you call people, knows I'm born again. God, the devil, and me. That's it. You say, well, I can check your fruit out. Yeah, the fruit can be faked. It can be faked. Judas, a devil. Judas was a devil. He was kind of a weird being. He was called a devil. And he fooled the guys for three and a half years. Now, when you live with somebody for, less, for about a month, you pretty much can figure them out. Some folks, less than. After two weeks, the real them is coming out. Judas fooled him for three and a half years. A devil is a perfect counterfeit of Jesus Christ. Okay? And so, uh, you know, you just really don't know. That's the thing about the new birth. It's by faith. You see? And it's faith in what people say. Now, 2 Timothy 2.19 goes on. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But... In a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, First Corinthians mentioned gold, silver, but also of wood and of earth and some to honor and some to dishonor. Okay, a vessel of, of earth would be pottery. Vessel of earth. Some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man 
Therefore purge himself from these. What? The iniquity. Verse 19. He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. There's the work. Good work, word of what sort it is. First Corinthians chapter 3. Now, you go in God's house, you have different sort, different vessels in that house. You go in your house, you have different sort of vessels. Somebody walks in your house, I don't think you've ever had, has anybody ever had this happen to you? They walk in your house, they see your toilet, and they say, what a cool toilet. That is a vessel of dishonor. That is a useful vessel, and if it's not in good use, then it's going to stink in your house. You say, well, I don't want to be a toilet of God. Okay, then clean up your act. Depart from iniquity. You say, well, I don't mind being a toilet of God. That beats the alternative. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? It does beat the alternative. (laughs) Okay, but it's still a vessel of dishonor. Now, a vessel of honor would be a family picture. Okay, a portrait on the wall. A painting. That's a vessel of honor. That's a, that when somebody walks up that painting, they go ooh ah e. It gets honor. They don't go ooh ah e in the bathroom in the toilet unless it's really rank. Then they may go ooh or something like that. Okay, but a vessel. Now, what does a painting do? It collects dust. It is honorable, but it's not useful. Now, the ideal vessel is a vessel that's honorable, useful, sanctified, meat for the master's use. In my house, what would that be? I would say probably in my house, a vessel of honor, useful, meat for the master's use is our kitchen table. It's a beautiful table. I mean, it's a table that you can look at and say, ooh, give it honor. It's a table that's useful. You can eat grub on it. You can set your laptop on it, write a sermon, or read the Bible on it. Your laptop. You put your Bible on it. You can homeschool around it. I mean, it is useful. It is honorable. It is sanctified. And it's meat for the Master's use. Now, if an individual wants to be something like that for God, then depart from iniquity. That's what Second Timothy says. Depart from iniquity. Live a holy life. Now, here's the choice. Here's the, the gamut that runs it. The gamut is you be an ultimate friend of God. Who was called a friend of God in the Bible two times? Mr. Abraham. Abraham and Sarah are very unique people. They are used by God in all dispensations as an example. You have Abraham on one side who is a friend of God, James 2, Isaiah 41. And then on the other side of the coin, you have his nephew, Mr. Lot. Mr. Lot was called a righteous man in 2 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> Mr. Lot vexed his righteous soul day by day by the deeds of those sodomites. Mr. Lot was a judge, some appointed political official in Sodom. Can you imagine going to San Francisco, put out your banner, I want to run for office, I am a born-again Christian, I believe in the King James Bible. I don't think you're going to get elected. Not in San Francisco. You got to be a compromising twit in order to make it in San Francisco politically. That's Mr. Lot. The last thing you read about Mr. Lot, he gets drunk, his daughters get him drunk two nights in a row, commits incest. That's the last thing you read about Mr. Lot. That's the gamut. You got ultimately Abraham on one side, you got Mr. Lot over here who was saved yet so by fire he lost everything he had. He is an example of the modern day Christian. You go to the average church today, you'll find Lot through the entire church structure. You see, saved or lost? I don't know. God knows their heart. Not a clue. He lost. He's going to lose everything. Now, I mentioned last week, of, as far as the first thing on gold, how to get rich toward God, and that's laying up gold in heaven. Okay, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, I mentioned this last week about the idea of laying up gold in heaven. When a person lays up gold in heaven, how can one do that? And of course, our motive is not for the possession, but for the Savior, Jesus Christ. Even the heathen know that gold is used for worship. The heathen get things right once in a while. 
If you go to the if you go to a uh, hundred Christian colleges in America and ask them who Leviathan is, they wouldn't know who it is. You go to the heavy metal rockers and ask them who Leviathan is, they know Leviathan, Satan. Why don't the Christians know that and the devil guys know that? It's an amazing thing. I read lyrics of a song of a, of a heavy metal rocker and it had Leviathan, Apollyon, Lucifer, Satan, the devil. You write Moody Bible, they don't know who Leviathan They think he's some fire-breathing bug. A, a whale or a hippopotamus or a whirlpool. Write these schools and ask them. I've had kids do it. They don't know who Leviathan is, the great Satan, Job 41. The world knows that gold is used for worship. The Muslims know that gold is used for worship. Look at the Dome of the Rock. Isaiah chapter 44, the God, this, this is God speaking to man. And he says, look what the heathen do. Isaiah 44, verse 15. <clears throat> He said, Then shall it be for a man to burn, for he will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it and baketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god. Isaiah 44, 15. He maketh a god and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image and falleth down thereto. Now, what metal is he making this god out of? Isaiah 46, verse uh, 6. They lavish gold out of the bag and weigh silver in the balance and hire a goldsmith and he maketh it a god. They fall down, yea, they worship. When Slick Willie and Hillary or uh, Jezebel were in office years ago, remember all his immorality and fornication? People didn't care about that. What did they care about? The economy. Why? Gold. That's what man worships. He worships himself. Gold is a form of self-worship. And the way a person (coughs) attains gold, uh, lays up gold in heaven, is to worship God. You see, this is holy worship of God can be attained by the rich and poor, the bond and free, sick and health. It doesn't matter. This is gratitude expressed toward God Himself. Of course, worship is not what the Pope does, you know, and all that stuff. That's just a bunch of shenanigans. Okay, that's all make-believe. Worship of God is when you say, thank you. When people applaud at a ball game, that's worship. That's a form of worship. It's a form of honor. Clapping the hands is a form of honor to that player. Clapping the hands and bragging about God is a form of worship. Now, I went through some of these last week. No no use hitting them again. But gratitude towards God. Gratitude about direction in life. Did God give you direction in life? Okay, say thank you to Him. Honor Him. Answer to prayer? Okay, honor Him. Jesus Christ healed ten lepers. One came back and gave Him glory and thanks. Okay, honor Him. Worship God. You worship God by saying thank you. You're honoring Him. A knowledge of the Bible, when you get an interpretation of the Bible, thank God for it. Okay, those are forms of worship towards God. Another way you worship God is brag about His holiness. The one song in our hymn book, uh, number 70, Holy, Holy, Holy. Okay, Lord God Almighty. Twice in the Bible it says, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is, is to come. Uh, twice in the Bible it's got holy three times. You don't find in the Bible, love, 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 God is a God of love. You find God is love, but not three times. So you brag about God and about His holiness. Another way to worship God is you honor God even through disappointments, trials, and trouble. Job chapter 1. That's when the gold is the most fine. Job worshipped God after he lost ten children. After he lost all his wealth. Now again, this is repeat from last week. And belief in the Scriptures, meaning believing all the words of God, Acts 24, 14, Paul said, I believe all that the prophets have spoken. When you believe all that the prophets have spoken, Old Testament, New Testament, the general Christian establishment will call you a heretic, like they called Paul. That goes with the territory. 
When I have another believer or another, you know, preacher in here, oh, Hoffman, he's a heretic. I mark that down. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> that's not an insult, man. That's a compliment. Appreciate it. <clears throat> mark it down. Okay, and so that's the goal. Basically, a person <clears throat> lays up gold in heaven when you use your vo- words, when you use your voice, and express gratitude upward. Now, what about silver? <clears throat> you have gold, silver, precious stones. You run through the Bible and you try to find out what silver is associated with in the Bible. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 5, remember Levi, Leviticus is a handbook for the Old Testament priest. Leviticus 5 verse 15 mentions an offering of silver. An offering of silver is associated with the ministry. <clears throat> uh, speak it up for Jesus Christ. Psalms 12 verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The ministry and the words of God are associated with silver. Redemption. Judas betrayed Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah 11, verse 12 and 13. Silver is associated with redemption. <clears throat> Not only that, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 20. Have you ever heard this common saying? He has a silver-tongued orator. A silver-tongued orator is somebody who speaks forth eloquently and gives forth the truth. Proverbs 10, verse 20 says, The tongue of the just is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is little worth. Now, you lay up gold in heaven when you use your voice or your mind if you can't speak, but use your mind and you brag about God. You worship Him. That's when you lay up gold in heaven. You lay up silver in heaven when you take those words and you tell somebody else about that God in heaven. It's not directed towards the God. <clears throat> it's directed towards somebody else to honor that God. Now, why is that a less metal? It's because the number one thing that you can do is your personal relationship with Jesus Christ and honor your God. And what if God puts you in solitary confinement where you can't talk to anybody? You can still lay up gold in heaven by honoring God. Who did Noah talk to after the flood? Three boys, his wife, three daughter-in-laws. They were all righteous in the ark. Who did he get to witness to? You see, so one can lay up gold at any time in any place. You lay up silver in heaven when you speak up for Jesus Christ, when you give out a gospel tract, when you go street preaching, when you teach a Sunday school class, when you uh, witness to somebody on the job, when you tell somebody at work or anybody anywhere the truth about the Word of God, when you speak up, when you say something about the truth towards others, that's laying up silver in heaven. When your words are expressed toward God, that's laying up gold in heaven. When your words are expressed towards others about God, that's laying up silver. You see, that's faith. That's being a faithful prophet. A prophet is somebody who speaks up for God. You see, and so I don't care if the talks around the you know the cooler at work. You know, they're talking about some wickedness. Of, you know, and you bring up something about God or the Bible, and you don't like to hear what you guys are talking about. Or if somebody says, Jesus Christ, well, I didn't know that was a cuss word, pal. You know him personally? Somebody says, man, it's hot as hell out here. Man, I didn't know you believed in hell. I sure hope you're not going there. Take the words that people say and put it right back in them. Make them think about it. <clears throat> you see? And so... That's spreading silver. That is laying up silver in heaven. The next one is precious stones. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> precious stones in the Bible, if you run it, you'll find in 2 Samuel 12 that it is associated with royalty. In Proverbs 17, verse 8, you will find that it's associated with a gift. A gift is as a precious stones. In Isaiah 28, verse 16, a precious stone is referenced to Jesus Christ Himself. In Exodus chapter 28 in the Old Testament, God wrote the names of each of the tribes on one of the stones in the breastplate. 
Revelation chapter 2, he mentions that he's going to give you a new name when you get in heaven. I wonder if that nickname is going to be based upon our life after we got saved. How you doing, Dumbo? You know, something like that. Hey, Beach Alternative! You know, but even at that, but you know, I don't know what the new name is going to be. A nickname, a sweet name. Okay, and uh, precious stone is referring to a virtuous woman. Proverbs 31, verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman for a price as far above all rubies? <clears throat> a precious stone is an individual that God allowed you to be instrumental in their salvation. Paul calls this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He said, I begot them in the gospel. He became their spiritual father. Okay, and as, as a spiritual father of a, of a convert, then you want to help disciple them and not leave them on the doorstep of somebody else to disciple them. Now, granted, I understand that when sometimes you're traveling <clears throat> through a country and you pass on gospel tracts, there's no way you can follow those things up. But still, the idea, a precious stone would be like a convert that someone might lead to Jesus Christ. You see, corn bears corn. Soybeans bear soybeans. And a believer should bear another believer. Somewhere along the line, <clears throat> if God gives time and arranges the situation, and that would be a precious stone. Now, if you would, one, uh, one more place. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. <clears throat> Here's checkmate. When God gets one in checkmate, you're going to be like Jesus Christ. He would like you and I to uh, be like Jesus Christ as much as we possibly can here on earth. <clears throat> and He promises, great promises, that uh, you can be a part, partake of the divine nature. This is a manner of Paul's preaching. Colossians 1, verse 28, he says this, Whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in the simple principles of the Christian life. It didn't say that, did it? In the fundamentals of the faith. In the orthodoxy of our Christian church. No, he said all wisdom. All of it. In Acts 20, he says all the counsel of God. So he says, what does this do? <clears throat> that teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That was the motive of Paul's preaching. Is that everyone who heard him preach that ultimately when they hit the judgment seat of Christ, they hit the judgment seat of Christ perfect in Christ Jesus. How will that be attained? Verse 23 says, if, well, verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death to present you, that's the idea, to present you how holy, unblameable, unreprovable. The implications are that at the judgment seat of Christ, some may get a chewing out. Some of God's children, he may take their child and put him over his knee and give him a whooping. Okay, but the idea is there. Holy, unblameable, unreprovable in the sight. And then 23, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature, and then so forth, and you read down through that line, that's being presented perfect in Christ Jesus. But the basis, the catch in all this, is we do these things because of our love for Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If we have not charity, we are as nothing. And that's the purpose. That's how to lay up riches toward God. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray to help us recognize <clears throat> this idea of these doctrines. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to love Thee. And I pray that you'd help us recognize that <clears throat> you are... Uh, such a just God, a holy God. And Lord, I pray that you'd help each and every one who is born again, that you'd, each of us would live our lives, that we might express our gratitude towards thee and what you've done. 
and try to tell others about thee so that others might get in a position that they might glorify thee. And Lord, the amazing thing is that <clears throat> when we do these things because we love thee, then, then you want to pay back. You want to honor that by giving out gold, silver, precious stones, certain crowns, And Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to recognize that you are looking for voluntary friends to serve you because they love you. As a result of that, you will turn around like any coach does at the end of a sports season. He honors the players who have extra achievements. Lord, I pray you'd help us to might be people that want to honor you. Heads bowed and eyes to close. The instruments will play. If you need to use the altar, it's open. He said, Lay up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. Now, I just hit three there gold, silver, precious stones. You've got five crowns mentioned, possibly seven. You've got a wardrobe mentioned, 2 Corinthians 5. There's so much more there that can be said. The sad thing is that the spirit of this age and the Christian church, they think they're rich. They say, I'm rich toward God. God says, nope, you're not rich. You are miserable. You're poor. You're wretched. You're blind. You're naked. That's the spirit of the age we're in. Lord, I do thank you for these promises in this blessed book you've given us. Lord, I do pray you'd help us to honor you, bless you with these words. I pray that you'd help us to be a blessing to thee and uh, try to honor you, worship you, uh, simply because of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Vacation Bible School workers down there, and then we'll meet in the gym about 1230 for the...